Look, I get it. It's been nearly three years, but I'm finally back with another Rise and Fall video. And I'm sure you're all expecting me to cover another extremely well-known company like Acclaim, Rare, or even Neversoft. Well, no. Not exactly. This time, I decided to cover a strange company by the name of Data Design Interactive. And as much as I would love to explain why I decided to choose this company above all others I could have picked, I don't really want to spoil that for you yet. So Data Design Interactive were based out of the UK back in 1983, originally named Data Design Systems, and they were developing products for the ZX Spectrum, the Amstrad, and even the Commodore 64. They did produce and or develop plenty of titles, however, finding any sort of information on the majority of the games during this time frame, let alone footage, was way more frustrating than it was worth. And in some cases, the information that I was coming across conflicted from one website to another. So instead of talking about data design systems, we're going to jump straight ahead into the more interesting and infamous Data Design Interactive aka DDI. In 1990, Green Solutions, a company that manages the production of interactive products for the entertainment industry, purchased and acquired Data Design Systems, which then spurred them to changing the name into DDI, or again, Data Design Interactive. And Data Design was involved with some projects during the early 90s, like a game called Pinky for the Amiga, or the 1990s Game Boy adaptations of Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. Although the most notable game to be made by DDI during this time frame was none other than Rise of the Robots. This game was made for a handful of consoles, from the Philips CDI and Amiga consoles to the 3DO and PC. However, Data Design was responsible for the Super Nintendo, Game Gear, and Genesis adaptations. Now, if you know anything about Rise of the Robots, you'd know that it's incredibly bad. Graphically, it's somewhat ahead of its time, sure, but the main problem was that the game played like total garbage, partly due to the advanced graphics drawing way too much power from the consoles, causing dropped frames or slowdown becoming choppy in its animations and overall leaving the gameplay feeling sluggish to the point of being barely playable. Others cited the game for having piss poor controls, bad AI, and criticizing the game for being bland and boring. The other copies of the game that weren't made by DDI and instead by a relatively unknown company called Mirage didn't exactly fare any better either. In fact, there was a review left by Electronic Gaming Monthly saying that the 3DO version of the game was, and I quote, by far the worst fighting game he's ever seen. This disaster of a fighting game did not stop DDI. In fact, it pushed them to continue developing other titles. Oddly enough, there were two projects that DDI developed in 95, Death Watch for the Atari Jaguar and Waterworld for the Sega Genesis. However, both games ended up becoming cancelled. Death Watch's cancellation was a little bit interesting. There's some leaked gameplay footage that surfaced recently from a E3 event back in, I think, 1995. And from what I understand, the reason Death Watch was cancelled was due to Atari allegedly wanting to focus their attention to 3D games instead of something like Death Watch, which was a basic 2D side-scrolling shooter featuring a cockroach as the main protagonist. It didn't exactly look all that spectacular when you compare Death Watch to really any of the other iconic side-scrollers that came out this same year, like Rayman, Alien Soldier, and one of my personal favorites, Comic Zone. Even with those two cancellations, DDI continued forward in 96, developing two Jeopardy games for the Game Boy, although I'm not exactly sure what the difference is between the two games other than the questions, because they both utilize the same graphics, sound effects, and user interface. A bit of foreshadowing for what's to come. In 97, DDI's only project was a game they developed by the name of Conquest Earth for the MS-DOS and Windows. Conquest Earth, an RTS game where aliens from Jupiter invade Earth and 
you can choose to play either the humans or the aliens. Unfortunately, the game got poor reviews both by critics and users alike, citing graphical flaws such as slowdown speeds during gameplay, slow, hard-to-comprehend menus, and frame rate problems. The gameplay was also cited as being cryptic and incredibly frustrating. Reviewers state that if you don't have a manual for the game, you might as well not even bother as you're going to be spending a majority of your time reading and consulting the manual just trying to figure out even the most basic commands. In 1999, DDI developed LEGO Rock Raiders for the PC, which was another RTS game. Not much to really say about this one, except that it actually did moderately well. People generally like this game, and it still has somewhat of a cult following even today, thanks to the modding community. However, not even a year later, DDI developed a Rock Raiders game for the PS1, which was completely different. Instead of it being an RTS, it was stylized as, I guess, more of like a top-down action game. It did not do well with the critics, and most people hated it. In fact, you'll often come across comments and reviews online where people talk about how much they love the original PC version of the game and despise the PS1 abomination. To rub more salt into the wound, DDI even went out of their way to bait and switch the public by including images of the PC version on the backside of the PS1 box art. How they even got away with that without a false advertising claim, I'll never understand. DDI continued producing junk games in the year 2000 and 2001 that nobody remembers, like Gubble Buggy Racers for the Windows, Tonka Space Station, and Tonka Monster Trucks. Then 2002 comes around. The very first DDI game I've ever played, Nickelodeon Party Blast for the Xbox, Windows, and Nintendo GameCube. Oh man, so... I have no clue how DDI was even able to get the money or the license to create a Nickelodeon game due to how bad their track record was at this point. Party Blast? Well, I'll be blunt, it's atrocious. It's not even on the lengths of so bad it's funny. This is one of those titles where you play it and you feel bad for anyone else who's played it before you or even after. When I first put this game back into my GameCube way back when, I expected, oh, okay, maybe this is going to be like a Mario Party type format, but with Nickelodeon characters, that's totally fine with me. It sounds kind of cool. Instead, what we got was this hot steaming pile of shit. It's really just a bunch of mini games varying in difficulties from no skill required at all to being almost impossibly difficult or stupidly frustrating with little to no reason why. The sound effects are bad, the music is irritating, and the gameplay is straight up monotonous. It's, it's flat out boring. I guess the graphics were fine for the time, but it doesn't make up for the fact that the game is incredibly disappointing. Nickelodeon's Party Blast received a painful low score of 19% on Metacritic with a user rating of 3.6. You almost have to go out of your way to achieve a worse score. Okay, so we're going to jump ahead a few years just to cut out some of the fat because this next part is pretty significant for DDI. 2007, the golden year for the company. Why is that? Well, because this is when DDI started developing games for the Nintendo Wii. If I understand this correctly, in this very same year, they purchased a company called Metro 3D Europe LTD, which they ended up reforming into a dedicated publishing label for their Wii games called Popcorn Arcade. And in this year, the company developed a whopping grand total of 14 games. Granted, sure, some of them were ports from PS2 games they made a few years back, but that's not exactly the point I'm making here. 14 games in one year is alarming because this is a small company, all things considered. This isn't like a big name company like Activision, Acclaim, Midway, or Rare. It's DDI. So for a small company to shell out 14 games in one year raises a lot of questions and a lot of red flags. The most notorious games from the bunch were the titles Rock and Roll Adventures, Anubis 2, and Ninja Bread Man. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is briefly show off gameplay footage from these three games. 
and I want you to pay attention to exactly what is going on. Did you catch it? I hope so, because the levels are exactly the same. The sound effects, the menus, even the enemy placement is next to being identical. In the case of Anubis and Gingerbread Man, even the music is exactly the same. They literally reskinned the games over and over and over again and made people pay for it. Even better is that these games can easily be beaten in under a half an hour without even trying. I've watched a few videos where the games were completed in less than 18 minutes. And it's not even like DDI made any attempts at making the games good either. The hit detection is awful, much like the general gameplay. And the awkward controls aren't exactly anything to write home about either. The games remind me exactly like an early access game on Steam using asset flips. An asset flip, for those who aren't aware, is when a developer or whoever is paying for pre-made assets such as model renders, objects, music, and sound effects, the engine involved, the list goes on. So what ends up happening, usually, is that very little actual development goes into these games, so the production and developmental costs are stupid low because everything's basically just copy and pasted. Side topic here. Why is there an Anubis 2 when there was never a first game? It makes no sense. You know what, it, it doesn't even matter at this point. Anyway, how was DDI able to get away with something like this? Rehashing the same games over and over? It was almost like they flew so much under the radar that even with all the harsh criticisms they were receiving by the reviewers, gaming journalists, publications, and YouTubers, for example, that the bashings of the company did next to no damage to them. Let's think about this for a second. If a very popular game company did this exact same thing that DDI did with those three games I just mentioned, they would be executed for it. But DDI pretty much got away with murder scotch-free because no one knew of the company, and truthfully, no one really gave a shit about them either. Another arguably controversial few games that came out in 2007 were the two Myth Makers titles that DDI developed, Orbs of Doom and Super Kart GP. First off, let's start with Orbs of Doom. I don't know if you guys have ever played Super Monkey Ball, 
but this is nearly the same game except terrible and nauseating. Also, it has the same fucking music and menu design from the last games I just talked about. The controls are frustrating to the point of becoming next to unplayable for a child, or really anyone for that matter. It's a revolting bad game all around, and much like with Ninja Breadman and the others, this game was universally hated by everyone. As for Mythmaker Supercart, well, the graphics are exactly what you would expect. The funny thing is that the game has no music, which I guess you would see that as somewhat of a redeeming quality, but it isn't. For you see, instead you get to hear the go-karts the entire time you play the game. It's almost like white noise if it were even more annoying. Like a group of bees almost, and it never stops. The controls, oh god, they're gross. You know, it's easy for me or really anyone to say that the controls are terrible in games, but without physically playing the games yourself, you really have no idea how bad the controls really are. What I thought was kind of funny about this game, and most other DDI games around this era, is that the games are printed on a CD-ROM. Why does that matter? Why, why does that play any sort of significance? Well, because CD-ROMs hold very little memory, whereas DVD-ROMs hold significantly more data. There is such little content in these games that the total data for a game like Mythmakers barely goes over 100 megabytes, which is nearly half of what a single layer CD-ROM can store. Bear in mind, a single layer DVD, which was obviously commonly used during this time, holds approximately 4.7 gigs of data. To put things in a different perspective, Blu-ray discs, like on your PS3, hold 25 gigs. Again, they charged people money for these games. Regardless if they are budget titles or not, this is not okay. There is no excuse for this. Moving forward, digressing into the seamlessly endless vault of garbage, we have a game called Mini Desktop Racing. I bought this game many years ago for a dollar at GameStop, well before I knew anything about the company. I played it a few years later, and even though it's been forever since I've touched this game, I remember everything about it. It's awful. I'm talking painfully awful to play or really even watch. Much like with the aforementioned games, the music's bad, the sound effects are grating, menu design, blah blah blah. The idea is great. Resurrecting an old school style of racing game, much like Micro Machines, is fine, and I could totally get behind that. The execution, however, is a different story. The game would have been passable to those with, I guess, very, very low standards if it wasn't for the controls. In order to control the cars in this game, you have to hold your Wiimote forward and turn your car by twisting the Wiimote. What the hell is that? Why wouldn't you set it up in a format similar to, say, Mario Kart, or really any other Wii racing game, by holding the Wiimote sideways like this? Who came up with this control scheme, and, and why? It makes controlling the cars so awkward, so difficult, and uncomfortable. The moment you crash in this game, you might as well reset, because catching up with the pack is stupidly difficult, again, thanks to the controls. The only other game that DDI shat out in 2007 that I even want to showcase is another of their infamously dreadful games, Billy the Wizard Rocket Broomstick Racing. Mind you, the main character's name isn't Billy, it's Barry. Barry Hatter. Oh god. Again, DDI borrows, or rather copy and paste, elements from other games. This game is notorious for having some of the most confusing, frustrating, and maybe going as far as to say, the worst control scheme of any game on a Wii console. Why is it that bad? Well, for one, you move your character by tilting and twisting the nunchuck. The Z and C buttons are used to accelerate and brake, and the sensitivity while controlling every aspect of your character is so insanely high that you wind up throwing your guy in every direction except for where you actually want to go. You know what this game reminds me a lot of? 
Superman 64 on the Nintendo 64, except this game's controls are significantly worse, if you could ever believe that. It's awkward. It's so confusing. The nunchuck has an analog. Why wouldn't you program the game to utilize that instead of the weird motion controls that make no sense? It's because of that that most players don't even make it past the first level or so. And if you do manage to pass the first level, or second, hell even the third, you'll notice that every level of the game, 24 to be exact, is played on the exact same location. They didn't even attempt to add variety or any other maps. The same few game modes featured on the same exact map. Of course, there were other games that DDI made in 2007 that I have not talked about for the sake of time, such as Monster Trucks with an X, Arenas, Rig Racer 2, Kawasaki Quad Bikes, and Call of Heroes Pompolic Wars. All of these games did poorly. So poorly, in fact, that if I am correct, DDI's highest rated game at this point was technically LEGO Rock Raiders for the PC. The highest rated DDI game in 2007, according to IGN, was, believe it or not, Mythmaker's Super Kart. Then again, it's IGN known for their laughably bad, inconsistent scoring and questionable reviews, so I guess take that with a grain of salt. The following year of 2008, DDI and their Popcorn Arcade developed, and I use that word very loosely, another 13 games. Of course, some of them are ports from earlier PS2 titles they made a few years prior, such as Mythmaker's Trixie in Toyland, which is again another Ninja Breadman clone with somewhat more difficult level design. Then there was London Taxi, Rush Hour, and a few others. Also, before I move on, when I talk about release dates, I'm talking about US. Since that's where I'm from, DDI being a European company, their games were released at earlier times in comparison with the US or anywhere else for that matter. Anyway, in the same year of 2008, DDI opened up a headquarters building in Sarasota, Florida, not even two hours away from Disney World. This was their first and only venture into building a headquarters in America. That being said, I have no idea what this studio did differently from their main headquarters back in the UK, or what the purpose of it was. But I suppose we should talk about a game they allegedly developed called Action Girls Racing. Girls is spelled with a Z. I guess that's a trend that DDI continued with in their handful of kids sports games. Action Girls Racing is noted for being one of the worst Wii games of all time. What they did here is basically copied that Myth Makers Racing game, but somehow found a way to make it significantly worse, if you can believe that. Action Girls Racing was initially released a month after the Myth Makers game, which is kind of interesting since it really is a copy and paste of Myth Makers, but obviously targeted to girls. But what makes this game so much worse is the camera angle. It's hard to see what's going on in front of you. Worse yet is the ungodly level design. Due to the horrific controls, you wind up crashing into walls and objects over and over again. Well, that and it doesn't help that you can't hardly tell when there's even a turn coming. It's also broken in many ways. For you see, sometimes when you hit the walls, instead of bouncing off them, you go straight through. The best part is that sometimes the game doesn't even register that you're out of bounds, so you're forced to start the race over again. This game has by far the worst track and camera design of any racing game I've ever seen. DDI, for some inexplicable reason, put dead ends in the tracks. They're not shortcuts, nor do they have any special purpose for existing other than to piss you off to the point where you eject the disc and throw it out your fucking window. I want to know who thought dead ends in a kid's racing game was a good idea. Maybe in something like Burnout, but that that's totally different. But this game was targeted to kids, young girls to be specific. They're not going to understand a game like this, let alone most people for that matter, so it's inexcusable and it's no surprise that this game is rated as the worst Wii game of all time. In fact, IGN, again, take it with a grain of salt, gave this game a 0.8 out of 10. 
a point eight. I've never seen a worse rated game in my entire life from any magazine or publication. But again, DDI pressed on by making those other games this year. For whatever reason, most of the games in 2007 and 2008 are racing games. I guess because maybe they're the easiest to, I don't even wanna say develop because that comes off as incredibly misleading at this point. Anyway, of those not developed games, they made not five, not 10, but 16 racing games. 16 out of 27 games. One of these sorta of racing games was Hamster Heroes. Um, right off the bat, let's just get this out there. It's another Myth Makers Orbs game, just straight up. It's the same game with a different level design, same copied music from previous games, same awful nauseating camera, same controls, Oh, and you know what? I totally forgot to mention, DDI even made another one of these ungodly super monkey ball ripoffs in 2007 that was based off of an American Tale. The only redeeming quality of this American Tale game is that it's played on the PS2 using the analogs instead of the Wii's terribly programmed motion controls. I guess that's a benefit. But let's change direction here and talk about those kids again, kids with a Z, sports games that DDI made for the Wii in 2008. There were four of them in total. Basketball, crazy mini golf, ice hockey, and international football, aka soccer. There was supposed to be a baseball game, but it was canceled for whatever reason, although I think I have a good idea why that was. But first, the mini golf game. This one is confusing. It's almost like they actually put forth some sort of effort into it solely because of the fact it has a character customization option. Now that aside, the physics of the ball make absolutely no sense. It's hard to really explain, but when you hit the ball, it moves in probably the most unnatural way possible. Visually, the game is lackluster. No real different from most DDI games, much like the horrible motion controls that plague every single one of them. This one, of course, is no different, and that's kind of hilarious to me because this game, Crazy Mini Golf for the Wii, has motion plus compatibility, but you never know the difference because the controls are still bad. The game is probably one of the more playable titles made from DDI, even with the weird physics, but that doesn't exactly make it fun or enjoyable, even from a so bad it's good perspective. I love those types of games, to be honest with you. Games like Rogue Warrior, Soldier of Fortune Payback, Dead Alliance, even a game like 50 Cent Blood on the Sand is great because it's so bad. These are games that are enjoyable for whatever reason, despite their downfalls. This game, Kids Sports Crazy Mini Golf, is not one of those. It's just a bad game. Or maybe even a step below mediocre. Playable to a degree fine, but not worth bothering with. The other kids sports titles are of an entirely different breed because they're borderline the exact same games. I mean, look at them. They're all using the same camera angle, the same grueling sound effects, same awful graphics, and even the scorecard that overlays everything on the bottom are carried over from every single one of the games. Nothing about these games differ from each other. They're all exactly the same. And I bet you the reason why they canceled that baseball game was because they couldn't figure out how to copy and paste this format into a baseball title. They weren't gonna make something from scratch, are you kidding? They wanted to copy and paste like they did with all those platformers, all those Super Monkey Ball clones, and now these sports games, and they couldn't figure out something as simple as fucking baseball. At this point, do I even need to talk about the games other than saying that they're terrible by all aspects and the controls barely even work? Is there even a point in saying it? Probably not. Like always, DDI fails to deliver anything of value. DDI fails to create anything with any sort of redeeming qualities. Shit, at this point, I'd settle for one redeeming quality, but they can't even do one thing right. And you can't say that them being a budget developer is why the games are the way they are. That's a load of bullshit. 
there are plenty of budget developers that have created masterpieces compared to anything that DDI has ever even come up with. Even developers whose money primarily stemmed from crowdfunding look like AAA titles compared to whatever this is. <sighs> the more I talk about this travesty of a game company, the angrier I get, but we're not done yet. In 2009, oddly enough, DDI only released three games. Another kid's sports mini golf, something called Party Pigs Farmyard Games, and last but not least, Battle Rage The Robot Wars. The Mini Golf 2 game? What do you want me to say? It's the same fucking game as before, just with different levels. The controls are the same, still unresponsive, still wonky as hell. That's all I got. Party Pigs Farmyard? I also got nothing to say about this game other than thanks but no thanks. It's so ugly, it looks like shit, I want nothing to do with it. Battle Rage, however, is one that caught my eye. Primarily, I guess, due to the cover. You know I lied. One redeeming quality, I guess, of DDIs is that their cover art actually isn't too bad. Some of them I would even say look cool or interesting, which is possibly what is enticing people into looking at their games. So, I myself am a big fan of mechs. I used to watch Gundam every single day after school way back when Toonami was a thing. I love Armored Core, Front Mission Evolved, Mech Warrior, Titanfall, the list goes on. I love mechs, so naturally this sort of game would normally catch my interest. I, I can't lie to you, I'm almost trying as hard as I can to avoid talking about this game because it's, it's really bad. No, God, I mean really bad. So bad, I have no desire to play any sort of mech game for quite a while. I mean, look at it. Look at how clunky it is. The frame rate is so choppy. The camera angle, I mean, wh what's going on? Why can I only see half of my mech? It's an arena combat third person shooter. Pull that damn camera back. I can't even see if my mech has any legs, let alone a waist. The combat's like torture. Again, because the controls barely work. When you attempt to melee the enemy by, of course, swinging your nunchuck around like a blithering idiot, it only registers about half the time. Battle Rage, much like with other games in the DDI's library of filth, is considered to be one of the worst games on the Nintendo Wii. And even by just viewing some sort of gameplay, and even the horrible trailer they decided to put out, it's really not hard to see why. It's insane to believe that any of these games had someone behind the helms testing them. Testing them to the point of going, ah oh, yeah, this is great, totally ready for release. To say that DDI has any quality control over their products is an outright lie. They did not care about what they released. They did not care who they scammed. Well, they didn't really care, period. And it's obvious. Jesus Christ, even the early access games that are flat out scams, those asset flips, or even dumpster fire games, do a better job than DDI ever has. The final year of DDI's existence, they developed yet another two games. One being a golf simulator that no one cared about, and the other called Junior League Sports. The last game DDI developed before the company went under is a compilation disc of the sports games, the kit sports games. They straight copy and pasted them. It's, it's unbelievable. Actually, no, it's, it's not. Why wouldn't the final DDI game be another rehashed title? It's not even like they changed anything either, outside of maybe, I guess, the menus. Everything else is exactly the same. Look, I don't like seeing any company go out of business, but thankfully in 2012, DDI ceased to exist any longer. This wouldn't be the last we would see of a DDI game. November 15th, 2019, for the price of $29.99. A game was released from the UK publisher called Funbox Media for the Nintendo Switch. You want to know what that game was called? Of course you do. Junior League Sports. Yeah, the very same game that was released nearly 10 years prior 
First off, why? Why would you do this? Why re-release a game that was critically ripped to shreds 10 years prior, as if somehow the game would age like a fine wine or something? Well, it didn't. It's the same game. Yeah, the graphics are better, but who gives a shit? The game's hot garbage. At this point, you're probably wondering why I picked DDI to make this Rise and Fall video on. Well, because you see, DDI did rise to the top of becoming one of the worst, most infamously bad game developers of all time. They made some of the worst, if not the worst, Nintendo Wii games in all of the Wii's nearly endless library of great games in, well, shovelware. DDI, with the exception of the PC version of LEGO Rock Raiders, has never once made a good game. They were all terrible, trash titles, best left locked away in a vault somewhere for no one to find. But what truly fascinates me about this company, what the main kicker was for me, is how they got away with this for such a long period of time. The fact that they were able to copy and paste so many games from the platformers to the monkey ball clones and the other trash they vomited into a Wii disc is pretty astounding. How were they able to get the money? How were they able to build multiple headquarters? How were they even able to get publishers in the first place? It's all so confusing and maddening, but at the same time, it's fascinating. I want to know more about this company. There was even rumors and speculations, but I don't know if they're entirely true, like how DDI was apparently going to develop a Sonic game for the Wii. And I can only imagine what that would have been like or how some of their employees were from another notorious developer, LJN. This is why I chose DDI over anyone else. This is a company I will never fully understand how they ever remained in business for so long, and a company that rose to becoming the best at creating the worst Wii games of all time. So that's it everyone, that's all I got. I hope you all enjoyed this Rise and Fall video. I know it was unexpected and kind of weird this time around, but regardless, even though I was in misery playing some of these games, I thoroughly enjoyed making this video. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to like and subscribe. I don't ever ask for these sorts of things, but I make exceptions for videos like this that take me damn near forever to make. Again, everyone, thank you so much. And as always, take care.